Good morning. Hi, I'm Michael Chevy Castronova. I'm the business editor at the Gazette. Welcome to our final Gazette Business Breakfast panel for 2021. So it's no secret a lot has changed in the business world and elsewhere since 2019. Um, and continues to change. We thought we had it all set for 2020, but oh, look, we didn't count on a pandemic. We didn't count on a derecho. And 2021 so far has been pretty much a year of all kinds of adjustments. And I don't know about you, but I can't say I'm entirely prepared for 2022 either. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning with this panel. We'll talk about how to manage for change. We're going to try and talk about productivity accountability. We've got employees working from home. We've got them in the workplace. We've got them in both places and hybrids. How do you effectively protect your work with employees being all over? Um, and how do you take care of yourselves as decision makers? Because I know that's kind of important too. Um, before we begin our discussion, we have with us this, this morning from our sponsor, Bergman KDV, Nicole Mead, who's going to speak to us for just a bit. Hey, Nicole, how are Hello. you? Hello, thank you so much, and welcome, everybody. I'm very excited, and Bergman KDV is very excited to be sponsoring this breakfast series. And as Michael said, this couldn't come at a, a more timely um, time of the year for this discussion. Like many of you, our team has been having many business conversations around managing the hybrid workforce and impact that that will have on both the culture and the bottom line of your company. And as your area financial business and technology partner, we are helping implement solutions to help streamline this back office for organizations and make the day-to-day -day operations more compliant, secure, and efficient. Some of the solutions we have that can do that are our human capital management platform, um, our managed service and security offerings. We have a full-on ERP implementation team that is really busy right now, which is great. And most recently, we have the addition of uh, business in intelligence and analytics solution. And if you're interested in learning any more about that, please reach out and I will connect you to a member of our advisory team. And with that, I'll, I'll kick it back over to Michael and the panel. And thank you for letting me spend a couple minutes to share about Bergen KDV this morning. Enjoy, everyone. Thanks, Nicole. I also want to mention our community partners, Nuboco and Quarter Careers, the local jobs with a national reach. So now to our panel. For those of you watching live, I want to remind you, you can submit questions and comments um, through the Q&A button, through the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Those will go to our room host this morning um, and she'll send them along to me. Please do not wait until the final 15 minutes of our panel. Um, can't promise you'll get your, your questions answered if you do that. Uh, it greatly reduces the odds. Yes, good, great. To our panelists, I'd like to go around the screen here and have each of you introduce yourself just briefly, your, your name, your title, where you work, and just, I don't know, a brief executive summary of what you do here. So from the top left of my screen, Becky, you're first. Great. Good morning. I'm Becky Streff, Vice President of Organizational Excellence with ESP International here in Cedar Rapids. We're a 100% employee-owned company um, headquartered, but we've got branches all over the world um, and a few domestically that I'll, I'll talk in more detail about later. Um, as a company, we design and contract manufacture sales and sealing products for a wide variety of industries. My specific scope is I get to play in the intersection of business needs and people needs. So I get to play in HR and continuous improvement, safety, um, information technology, facilities, and quality management systems. Thanks, Becky. Brandon, we're not going alphabetically. We're going around the screen now. Brandon. All right. Outstanding. Uh, my name is Brandon Blankenship. I'm a board member at SEC Midwest, which is a community outreach organization to get people interested in information security. I also do security consulting with ProCircular, which is a cybersecurity company out of Corville. Thank you. Terry. Yes, good morning. I'm Terry Davis. I'm an uh, attorney and senior vice president with Shuttleworth and Ingersoll, and we're a full service law firm with over 50 attorneys in, with offices in both Cedar Rapids and Coralville. Uh, I am located in the Coralville office. Um, although we are a full service uh, law firm, I focus on employment law. I head up our employment law practice group. 
um, which has uh, not surprisingly been very busy over the last few <laughs> And that is why you're here this morning. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Samantha, you're next. Thank you for having me. Um, I am the human resources business partner or director at the Skywalk Group, and we are right across the street from Terry Davis at Shuttleworth and Ingersoll, so we can wave <laughs> at each other from the windows when we're working. Um, we are a small woman-based, uh, woman-owned company who focus on three different things. So we do employee engagement and trainings, we do HR consulting, and then we do recruiting for organizations all over the country. So thanks for having me today. Excited about this panel. Thanks for being here. Talinda. Good morning, everyone. My name is Talinda Pettigrew, and I work at the University of Iowa as a Senior Director of Human Resources within the Division of Student Life. So um, I help support all things student, but through the folks that support those students. Um, we have so many units within the Division of Student Life. So we think about housing and dining. We have student health and wellness where we take care of students in that way. A lot of the programming, student care and assistance, um, um, the dean's office, all types of offices, uh, gosh, counseling services, so many services, so many service uh, kind of student affairs that support students. I support the folks that, that make up that group. So thanks everyone. And thanks for being here, Talinda. Okay, so our opening question, and this is for everyone. I'm going to ask each of you to address this in whatever order you want. In the past 20 months or so have been very interesting times, as we all know. And that's particularly the, true for hiring and retention and managing. <clears throat> what is one thing, one thing, that you've learned in that time, or maybe a bit of advice that you've had reinforced that you would say is key for nowadays, that you would just, from your experience and what you've seen, and I, yes, I know that's a really open-ended question, and that was on purpose. Who would like to go first? Just what one thing you would share from the Mount of Wisdom, from what you've seen? I'm happy to go first. I guess my, my takeaway is um, to invest in building a really great team of frontline managers because a person's relationship with that direct manager is the single greatest influence on their work life in terms of productivity, engagement, and tenure, that even the most sophisticated business process still needs humans to do the work, and building and retaining great teams really requires solid, active management. And those frontline managers are also a critical factor in your business risk management. So they have to have the knowledge and the communication skills to support compliance, not just for human resource policies, but for other business practices as well. I would love to dovetail off of that. My um, big takeaway is to check in on employees and meet them where they're at. Um, for example, Brandon Blake and Ship and I work together every now and again, but if we haven't met or checked in on each other in a few months, all of a sudden he has this great big beard that I didn't know about. So, um, and I had a child. And so there are some things that if we're not checking in on each other to see how we're doing, to foster those relationships, um, we don't know how our team's doing. We can't assess whether or not they're happy or what they need. So checking in on people means oftentimes making them turn on their videos. And that can be unpopular, but that direct eye contact, if we can't be together in the office, we need to be seeing each other and just, how are you feeling today? How are things going for you? What can I do to help you kind of thing? So Samantha, just to follow up quickly. So when you say check-in, it doesn't necessarily have to be, go sit down with a cup of coffee at that person's desk. It doesn't have to be. One of the fun things that we've been experimenting with at the Skywalk Group is handwritten notes, just mailing them to people's houses saying, hope you're having a great week. Or it could be anything that just shows employees that we care and that we were here for them if they need any support. And that's kind of where employee assistance programs can come into play too. So providing those maybe free counseling sessions with a third party, but it's just really important to be checking in on people to make sure they're okay and they're getting what they need. Otherwise, Otherwise, they're sharpening up that resume and they're looking to leave. I'm happy to jump in on this question also. I, I think what I, the, the sort of overarching uh, theme that I've seen over the last almost two years now is the, the necessity of flexibility of an organization. I mean, when this all started in March 2020, everybody was sort of forced into being flexible and everybody had to work from home and, and we all made those um, adaptations because we had to. Um, fast forward to mid-2021, we were all excited. The vaccines were out. 
we could bring people back to the workplace. You know, we started doing that and then boom, Delta hits in, you know, August, July and August of 2021. Flexibility, we had to dial back. A lot of companies said, whoa, we're going to wait to come back to the office or we're going to, you know, switch to a more hybrid model, whatever. But, but that flexibility with management and, you know, to be honest, a lot of our organizations are older, more um, settled, more set in their ways. And it's been, you know, it's been difficult for some of these organizations to realize that, yes, we might have people working remote or hybrid long term. This may be the future. It might not have just been a temporary fix, but that having that uh, open mindedness and flexibility um, has been key for organizations to continue to move forward. Well, you're right, Terry. In March of 2020, we thought we were going to be out of the office for a few weeks, maybe a month or two. <laughs> I think I could dovetail on, because mine is very similar to Terry's. It is, uh, if I had to pick one thing and you, you limit it to one, but I want to have like sneak like six in there, but really the one thing is business continuity planning. So a lot of organizations maybe had a business continuity plan or an incident response plan on paper, but never rehearsed it, never did a tabletop mm -hmm. exercise and didn't truly think it through. And, you know, it's like kind of hard to beat up on people about their policies and procedures. But in this last couple of years, we've really seen that having a, a real BCP, it, it, it's, it matters. And the companies that had put some thought into it were a lot more nimble and agile and able to land on their feet this, this last couple of years. In fact, ProCircular was very, very good at that, Brandon. ProCircular <laughs> did what's called pandemic practice because they had a policy and they had a plan. They all went remote for, I think it was supposed to be, what, two weeks, Brandon? Mm -hmm. yep. And then, and then you <laughs> never turned, went back. <laughs> right. It was a very good exercise. And then it counts as a table that counts as a rehearsal. And then, wow, we're doing it. So, yeah, I mean, we saw it starting to happen around the world and we're like, we better get our ducks in a row and make darn sure we can do this. Make sure we understand uh, that every, you know, we already had our arms around VPN. We already could do that, but we just wanted to be sure that they, we got the snags worked out. They got worked out for us. <laughs> Selinda, what do you think? Sure. I, I think, you know, as I'm listening care and thinking about, you know, what 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 stood out for me is, is providing care for folks. And I really think care was the name of the game. So, you know, when there was, we were able to develop a stronger bond of trust among employees and between the company during this time. And, and, and if you took advantage of things the right way, you were able to um, develop a sense of loyalty. Um, employees were really appreciating and looking at folks that took care of them during a really stressful time. So we talked about being, being more flexible, checking in on people, all of those things show, uh, show companies how we felt about, or, or rather showed the employees how we felt about them. Um, and it's going to help them rebuild faster. So companies that took the time to do these things and continue to do these things, their recovery is not going to be marked by, you know, think about the chaos of trying to figure out how to find new employees in these times, you know, as we talk about folks leaving um, to drive their growth, but instead they're already going to have a dedicated workforce that's really looking at that organization's success. Okay, so following up on that, so Terry, a question I wanted to ask you, and actually we have someone watching who submitted a very similar question. Um, so that's always good to know that I actually was able to, you know, magically know what that was going to be. Um, what have you learned at, at, at Shuttleworth and Ingersoll and in your position there in terms of accountability? You know, we have people working, we don't see them. I have an employee who's really, really good. And I don't want to sound any other way. I've not actually seen her other than in Zoom. It's not quite two years and she's doing a great job. I don't, nothing bad about this, but how do you, how do you think about work with all these people working remotely? How do you well, apply for that? Yeah, I think once we got past the initial crisis period, um, I, I worked with employers to think about it in a more um, planned and long-term way. And typically what that means is you probably need to make clear uh, expectations known put a policy in place so that employees know what's expected as far as, you know, times that they're expected to be available to be working. Um, and then clear expectations about what's required if they're going to be working from home, whether that's, you know, technology wise that they have, you know, reliable internet and a mm -hmm. private place to work and uh, childcare if they need childcare. Um, those sorts of issues and expectations should be set out clearly so that nobody, you know, you don't have the employer going, well, wait, she's never available when I need her at, 
you know, three o'clock, why is that? You know, but, but having those expectations set out, I agree with what Samantha said, though. I mean, you have to have that, uh, a good team and a trust relationship with your folks, but coupled with that, then you have to have clear expectations so they know what they need to be doing to be successful, um, metrics, and, and like you've seen, Michael, I mean, even though you haven't seen this employee in almost two years, if they're doing a good job, they're meeting expectations, they're getting things done that need to be done, then that's, that's a win-win. And, and putting your trust in an employee and then having it work out that way, I think has, I mean, I think we've learned a lot about each other over this last year and a half. But, but when I'm dealing with employers and talking with them about how to move this forward and keep it successful, it's really a matter of setting clear expectations so that everybody knows what's expected, everybody knows when and where and how. You know, if you're going to require that you have your video screen on when we have Zoom meetings, you know, those sorts of things. Um, and then also, as Samantha and some others have said, it's, it's obviously making sure that you're still um, having that personal connection. So if you're a manager, making sure that you're still having that personal connection with sure. each member of your team uh, on regular intervals so you know how they're doing, you know if they're struggling, you're, you're having that conversation, what can I do to help? you know, um, what sorts of issues are you having? How can we help you? Um, but making sure that personal connection continues so that your employees feel supported, they feel engaged, um, they feel like they're still part of the team. So Becky, I'm going to come to you because in a moment, because I know you, you work at ESP, which is an on-site manufacturer, and they can't all work at home. But to Linda and Samantha, I both saw you nodding your heads a lot on that, on what <laughs> Terry was saying. Would you like to I add think to that? Terry is, yeah, Terry's spot on. I think when it comes to accountability, there is software out there now where some organizations are monitoring how many times you're clicking your mouse or how often you have your screen pulled up and you're logged in. Um, not sure that's necessary. Um, maybe for some clients it is, but um, I agree. There's also a difference between hourly or hourly um, non-exempt or exempt salary individuals as well? Is it that you expect them to be getting their hours in and you want them to clock, you know, 40 hours a week? Or is it, we'd like you to hit these metrics, these, these five priorities that you have, and you can get it in when you can get it in. You decide when to clock in and when to not. And just like your employee, Michael, um, if they're getting their job done, does it matter that they're working a full 40 hours? Or if it requires more, will they stay late? And if it requires less, can they clock out and go take their dogs for a walk because it's a nice day? I think that flexibility comes in there too. So Terry is absolutely right. Defining those expectations will really help. I'd like to yes and what Samantha just said. With I'm a firm believer in you know KPIs. So whatever whatever your performance indicators are for your employees, if they're hitting those KPIs, uh, especially from like IT, you know I've I've seen the software that Samantha was talking about whatever you measure, measure people will do. So if you're measuring mouse wiggles and how many times they touch the keyboard, then they're going to wiggle their mouse and touch the keyboard. And that doesn't make the organization any money. So uh, I, I would, I would choose the KPIs wisely, not less number of logins. And, and I don't want it depend. I'm thinking it in terms of, you know, salaried employees and who have long projects and things like that. But yes, I absolutely agree with everything Samantha just said. So Linda, you were going to weigh in on that. Sure. I was just going to say it, it is folks do well. They do better when they know what's expected of them. That's, that's just so critical to their success and to your, your success. And you're not going to have, you're going to avoid those misunderstandings as much as you can, especially remotely when we're missing so much of those cues that we typically have. I mean, we're all trying to, even though it's 20 months in, you know, think that's interesting to think about in itself, 20 months, but we're, we're still learning right? How to engage and interact with one another and read people. And, and now some of us are going back and forth and you're realizing that it is very different. I don't, I, I, I don't always communicate in the same way or I don't get things across in the same way. So it's really important for us to know, as Terry said, what are the expectations? What do you need for me so that I can rise to it and I can meet what you need me to do for business goals and objectives? Just so, one of the issues yeah. that Samantha raised um, about hourly versus salaried employees this has created some you know, new issues for employers because if you have hourly workers working from home, you know, making sure that you have a clear expectation and understanding of what times they're working, you know, um, and you know, are they working at nine o'clock at night? And does that mean they're working more than 40 hours a week? Um, you know, then all of a sudden you have concerns with overtime and 
and other wage and hour implications that come into that. So that's an, just another reason why you need to have set clear expectations, maybe a clear schedule. If you're going to have 100% flexibility, as long as they're getting done what they need to get done, you need to have that frank discussion with them about then, you know, if it's going to be over 40 hours a week, you need to communicate that and get approval for that, you know, whatever it is, so that so that both sides understand what's happening as far as how many hours they're working per week. And just to weigh in, I, I love that. But another thing is what we're starting to see people aren't clocking their time, which is, a, again, a huge problem. So someone will see an email come in from their supervisor late at night and check it real quick. But if they're hourly, you need to clock in for that so that we can pay you for that time if you're going to be available. Um, so I agree with Terry. Thanks for calling that out. And it's important that they clock in when they do that at two in the morning, because why? Well, if they are allowed to flex their hours and work whenever, that should be outlined in the expectations. But if an hourly employee is working, e even if they're you know clocking in to enter their time or whatever that is, if you are working, you should be clocking your hours if you have permission to, to be working outside of regular expectations so that we as employers can pay you for your work. And even if you don't have permission and you're working outside of your normal work hours, mm -hmm. it needs to be recorded and compensated. Yeah. Right. So Becky, different world at ESP, right? Because you're an on-site manufacturer. How many people work at ESP? So we have roughly 85 employees in Cedar Rapids, another 70 in Davenport. And then we have 20 people in our branch in Dallas and about 60 people overseas in our subsidiaries in India and China. So during the pandemic, we had roughly 60% of our employees remained on site because they're in production or warehouse roles. And then the rest of our employees joined the work from home revolution, like you essentially overnight um, in about mid-March of, of 2020. So we were very fortunate to be considered an essential business because of the industries that we serve. So we didn't have to close operations or lay anybody off um, during the, the pandemic. So as we kind of rode, you know, some of the wild rides, um, some of the lessons that we learned about managing, you know, this um, hybrid or, or mixed demographic is that we really had to meet people where they are. Um, I think Terry may have used that comment earlier. You know, we really had to adjust a lot of our culture building and communication initiatives to make sure that we we're meeting the needs, both the on-site and the remote workers. So a lot of times it meant changing the method, changing the timing, even changing the message to make sure that whatever it was we were putting out was both accessible and relevant to everybody. A um, couple other lessons learned. Um, keeping up traditions was really important. Um, even though we couldn't be together, there's things that we do on a monthly, quarterly, annually basis that we tried to maintain as many of those traditions as possible. We just went virtual um, with all of it. Um, showing empathy and gratitude was huge for us also during this time because whether our employees were moking, working remotely or on site, they were all making an adjustment um, and suffering in some way. You know, the people on site, yes, they had to come in and, and they may have had you know different level of exposure, but the people who were working from home, you know, were suffering because they weren't near to their peers and they had their own challenges managing um, daycare and school and pets and all the other things that come with working from home. So we really tried not to reinforce silos or stereotypes by calling out specific adjustments that either of those demographic was having to make. And so anything that we were doing, again, we tried to make sure that we were being uh, accessible and, and relevant to everybody, whether it was remote or on site. And then the last one I'll throw out is just that it really challenged us to toss out the old playbook. We had to get a lot more creative about how and when and where work got done. So we tried a lot of new things, uh, forgave a lot of stuff that used to be taboo and really challenged ourselves um, to define what productivity meant when you can't manage by walking around. So back to Brandon's comment on the KPIs, I think that you know the work from home was, was really hard, again, on those frontline managers who use observation and um, what they hear and, and see every day to determine when their team is getting stuck or when they are or aren't product, productive. So when they had to do that all, you know, video screen or from remote, um, that was a really big adjustment. But so we just, we just challenged them to really understand what's going to move the needle, separate productivity from busy, and um, be strong at communicating and, and checking in with their teams. You mentioned um, showing gratitude. 
-hmm. to employees. So can you give us an example or two of what, what ESP did? Sure. So um, it's common for us every quarter to give some kind of thank you gift, small little tokens, like a pack of gum with the fun saying like, thanks for going the extra mile, just little things that are small, are not expensive. And so whereas in the past, we used to walk those around, you know, we'd mail them home. Um, we have another uh, rewards and recognition program where people can basically give each other um, a thank you. We call them badges. We printed out the badges and we mailed it to the home. So the spouse and the family could see the kudos that their employees were getting from their peers and managers as well. So just little things, again, um, just high touch, meaningful, but, but we're not necessarily expensive. We just brought that stuff, you know, to them. Okay. All right. Uh, again, I want to remind people watching, please submit your questions now. We're almost at the halfway mark, so we can make sure we can get to those. <laughs> Talinda, um, you know, we're all having hiring issues and we've been having hiring issues in Iowa. I've been here 10 years, almost 11, and I cannot tell you how many panels we've had about how do we find more people? How do we get more people to work here? And, and, and Iowa does not have a large population. And now we've got this pandemic thing going on and we have people who do want to work from home. Can I ask you and, and anyone else certainly can jump in on this? Um, how important is still, because now we need all the people we can get, how important is that hiring for diversity and inclusion? Is that still important? And I know that's a trick question. Are they sure the answer is yes? Why is it still it is, important? It is, it's a funny, it's a funny, it, it does make me smile and giggle. Michael, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it might be. It, it absolutely is, is still important. Um, and and I, th I think that it's a great opportunity right now. We, we're, we're open to more, right? We can, our, our, we, and by design and by force, we have to reach a little bit deeper to find people. So we've been hearing about the great resignation. We've been, you know, a lot of, a lot of women have been impacted um, and folks that are caregivers by um, what's happened with COVID-19 and the pandemic and, and have been taken out of the workforce. We're really struggling to find folks. And, and so it's kind of like now more than ever, we need to be looking further and casting our net wider than we used to. Um, to make sure that um, we bring in more people um, in, into our organizations. Uh, you know, I, I think a lot of us know some of the reasons why are we, we've heard them before, but if you haven't, you know, I'm happy to share some of the reasons with you. You, you know, we know that if we increase diversity within our organizations, that they, um, folks become more innovative. We come up with more innovative solutions. Um, we bring in folks with different ideas and different experiences, um, and, and they're really able to use their unique perspective to solve problems in ways that we hadn't thought about before. Um, we, we attract better talent when we do this. When we bring in other folks into the organization, it just it starts to become more inclusive, and we, we're able, I mean, you have, to, you have to take some action on doing this, but again, a critical mass is important. We start to develop a more um, welcoming culture in our organizations because folks are, are looking at folks that maybe look like them or have identities that are similar to theirs. Um, and they see those folks are flourishing in a really dynamic environment and they want to join and, and they want to be there right with you. Um, so um, that, that's really important for just talent and attracting um, better talent. Um, folks that are, you know, when we bring in more diverse groups, there are groups are are more driven. So when we think about diversity, having folks be in a group that are that are different than you, it really jolts us, um, our, the cognitive action in our brain, um, and it forces us to behave and think differently because there's something different in front of us. So we're not on autopilot, right? Um, so, so again, that's just a way that's really going to, um, you know, foster having those different viewpoints. Um, and having those folks with different experiences really enrich the work that we do. And you're also going to have a better understanding of customer needs. Again, our, our customers, well, most of our businesses now are global, right? They're not local. Um, so e even when we start out that way, you know, it was interesting to hear Samantha talk about it. It was fun for me. Like it's a local business. She's like, we help, you know, businesses all over the country. And that's exciting for me to think about, you know, we're kind of a smaller Iowa business, but we can do that. We're touching, we're touching folks all over the country. So, you know, you want to definitely make sure that you have a, a workforce that's more representative of your, your customers and helping you to bring in more customers who, um, and clients perhaps who aren't like the ones you've had before to keep sustaining your business model. Uh, so those are some of the reasons that I have, but happy to hear from others too. I'd like to chime in on what Talinda was talking about. Um, of course, diversity and inclusion are still 
huge issues. And um, as you recall, last year wasn't just a pandemic and a derecho, but we also had a nationwide, in fact, a worldwide social justice movement that led a lot of companies yes. to, you know, review their own policies and think about trying to, you know, reinvigorate their efforts at diversity and inclusion. And in some ways, uh, going to these remote and hybrid workforce models allows, I mean, it's recruiter's heaven. <laughs> All of a sudden we can recruit nationwide when we don't have to just recruit in Lynn County or Johnson County. So it opens up, you know, worldwide possibilities, a lot more diverse applicants potentially um, that you can bring into your organization if you're using the remote model. So that was a plus, uh, that was an advantage, um, I think, for organizations that wanted to increase their diversity inclusion. However, you also have people that are remote, <laughs> that aren't in, you're not seeing face to face. It, so that created some more challenges as far as actually assimilating um, and being inclusive with those diverse people that you're bringing into your workforce. So um, it, it is more of a challenge to make sure that you're assimilating those folks making sure that they become engaged and feel part of the team. Because otherwise, I th like I think Samantha said, they're polishing up their resume and they're going to move on. So that's been a real challenge over the last year and a half is taking advantage of this opportunity to increase the diversity of your workforce. But then you really have to make those extra efforts at connection and in inclusivity to make sure that you're, number one, getting full advantage of the, the diversity of the folks you've brought in and the new, new uh, insights and perspectives. And number two, making sure that they feel welcome and included and part of the team so that you can keep them uh, and not lose them. Okay, so following on from that, and I don't know how many of you saw it, but there was a, a report yesterday from the Washington Post. Um, it talked about what seemed to be, and we've heard this before, a pretty significant disconnect currently between many people still looking for work and the many businesses looking for workers. It cited a whole bunch of reasons for this. And Samantha, I'm gonna to come to you with this eventually. It cited a number of issues, including 55% of job seekers on ZipRecruiter wanting to work from home. And of course, some jobs, as Becky will tell us, you have to be there. Um, they want new careers, but yet higher managers still want you to show previous experience in that. So we've got this mix. And then there was a whole thing about how more jobs have become automated, that robots are doing it. And Brandon, I'm going to bring that to you later to explain this robot thing. But um, Samantha, what have you seen when you're talking to your clients? How do they navigate through all of this quagmire? And then we have you know, it, it's not a secret that not everyone in America is on board with getting a coronavirus vaccine. And some companies are saying, gee, we'd really like to have that with you. What do you hear? What are the concerns you're hearing? And how do you advise them to get through this whole briar patch of things? What a question. I don't know yes. where to even begin. And there were seven in there. Um, <laughs> yeah, pick, pick whatever Let's one see. you want. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, Let's start with um, how, let's see, how are people navigating that? So one thing we're doing um, that we used to do and we're doing differently is a manager would say, this is what I need, help us find someone. Now what we're doing is we're having more of an interactive discussion with people, talking about uh, what Delinda brought up with diversity, equity, and inclusion. One thing we're doing is saying, do you really need to require that degree? You're really going to cut your legs off um, if you're not opening it up to people who might have 10 years of experience and no degree. Would you consider that person? So we're really we're, we're working the hiring managers um, through their decisions and their um, requirements so that they're really thinking about it to hopefully open that up. Another thing we're doing um, is we. We as employers, um, and myself included, before we really started thinking about this, we can get very guilty of posting and praying, right? So I have an open position. Here's my posting. We'll pop it on Indeed. We'll wait to see who we have. We'll screen from there and roll with it. But we're not thinking about there's a very small 
portion of the people out there looking for jobs who have access to Indeed and only Indeed. So that might be where I've had success in the past. So I jumped to that. But maybe we're looking for um, maybe some candidates don't have a laptop at home or their internet isn't working because their children are at home soaking up all the internet because they're homeschooling right now. Or um, so what we're challenging people to do is maybe reaching out to people by posting that on Facebook instead would hit a demographic that might not be logging in with their laptop and going on indeed. Um, maybe there's a boots on the ground effort that we need to do where are we physically posting these positions? Are we um, working with our local partners um, that prioritize diversity so that we can get our jobs out there? Um, local to Cedar Rapids, two good ones that come to mind. Um, Urban Dreams is out there. They started in Des Moines and now they're, um, they're focusing on this demographic and they're trying to get people access to these postings that wouldn't have otherwise I seen them. So they're a partner that you can communicate with. Um, inclusive ICR, Quinn Pettifer is very involved in that. Um, and she that's another great resource. They, they want postings and positions to be out there so that the people who aren't necessarily um, on Indeed looking um, will find them. So that's, that's one part of your question is really how do we jump through that? And I would say we really need to be questioning what kind of postings we have and where we're posting them. So that might have only addressed one of the three pieces of your questions, but I'll open it up to see if anyone else wants to jump in. I can jump in a little bit on that. I, I'm going to choose to address the issue of, you know, of hiring and the, the security, the shortage of, of people in cybersecurity and IT in general. And so every year you see reports of millions of shortage, like shortage of millions of people in InfoSec that that we need the skill in America to do, to do these things. And ransomware has gotten worse in previous years. This last year, the spike has been you know, out outrageous with Colonial Pipeline and then other attacks, the Microsoft attack in March. And um, yeah, so yeah, we, we all have access to the news. So one of the sort of the answer to that is not trying to just hire the rock stars. It is uh, doing continuous learning for the people you already have and understanding that building into your budget, maybe you send them to a sand school, maybe you send them to get certifications on your dime and you start, you built that into their annual reviews, uh, that type of thing. So it's um, like gone are the days where we say, oh, we want to hire the rock star and they're going to start working. It's, we need to invest some money in them. They have to be extremely motivated. You're looking for hungry people that do have some skill. You're not trying to just build them from nothing. So that's one part of it. The second part is organizations like Sec Midwest, where we do meetings once a month, encourage people to come, and we try to raise people up that are trying to make the jump into cybersecurity. So maybe they're Kirkwood students, maybe they're you know, even high school students. And so if they want to be interested in cybersecurity, but they don't quite know what thing they need to do next, you know, we have this community where we try to... Uh, not be punishing. We try to be very, you know, inclusive of everybody and help, you know, help fight that imposter syndrome that a lot of people have and they might not be able to, they think they can't do the job. So I suppose that's my answer to the general question, the way I interpreted your question, Michael. <laughs> you, you know, Brandon, you bring up the point about hiring people who have this much skill and then training them to have the rest of it. Um, uh, businesses have been reluctant to do that for a very long time. Books have been, there are whole books written about, mm -hmm. you know, you advertise for somebody who has a degree in this, this, and this also speaks German and can do microbiology on the side and have not wanted to spend a lot of money on training. What in general for anyone, what have we seen changes in our businesses more willing? And I guess by business, I mean, for-profit, not for-profit, however you want to define that. Have we seen any more flexibility in being able to win, able to do that investment in training? I would Becky, say we what do you have. Say? I would say we have for a couple of reasons. Uh, partially, it's just become a bit of an expectation with the younger you know, demographic coming into the workforce that emphasis on continuous learning and, and wanting to have the feedback 
of doing a good job and, and seeing that it's something that they're getting as much out of what they're what they're putting in. So it's almost a, a hiring and retention issue, in addition to just you know another strategy to to build the the capacity in, in house. But we found too that you know hiring for those soft skills, those attributes, the value, and then training people. You know if you've got somebody who really is that much of a rock star, you either invest and keep them or you inv- don't invest and then they go somewhere else. And so not investing in people is almost a self-fulfilling prophecy because we definitely fell in that trap a few times where we had people and we, you know, spent advanced degrees and certifications and then they left. And so I think what it's, and it made us gun shy, but what we've learned is that you have to just, again, actively develop the talent and then actively retain the talent that, you know, don't be afraid of building great people into, you know, even greater um, employees, because otherwise you're missing out on the whole opportunity um, to benefit for what they're going to be capable of doing. I've seen the sort of the other side, I've seen a, a blend. So some organizations do invest in training right out of the gates, but the sort of the heart, what I think you were asking, Michael, I've seen the other end where, especially for IT and security, people will say, we were looking for an entry level position, but you need a CISSP with five years of experience. Yeah. And it's like, it's on resume. I mean, or it's, it's on job descriptions. And it's like, wait a second, that is not fair. There's mm-hmm. this big gap between, you know, and it's like, it's very hard to explain. And, I'm, and I don't know where, what's the cause of this. I don't know if it's just copying, pasting job descriptions or, or what, but it's, it's rampant. So um, mm-hmm. some organizations don't, and, and it's a, a blend, but that CISSP thing, like, that drives me nuts to see it because it's so discouraging to somebody just starting out trying to get it into, you know, into the workforce. And I'll say I've seen sort of a, a broad gamut of this. So I've seen everything from you know, Iowa manufacturers that are struggling to get people to work their lines that have um, developed partnerships with community colleges or high schools to do that uh, training at the beginning. So to get people trained as machinists or welders or whatever it is they need. Um, so creating those workers, creating that workforce. And then I also see um, more skilled employers that are now offering um, tuition reimbursement programs to, to finish that degree or to get that MBA. Uh, typically, those have some sort of you know, time requirement of service mm-hmm. after you've completed that degree or a clawback um, on what they've invested. Um, but I'm, I'm starting to see both of those because, you know, I think employers are starting to realize you're not going to get some cookie cutter pre-made person that's going to fit all the skills that we need and you have to help develop it. I would follow up by just saying um, one of the one of the questions you had in that question, Michael, was where do we find these people? Um, and in addition to what's being called the silver tsunami with the boomers retiring, um, one place that we can find people to at least try to start replacing these positions, two places, I'm, I'm calling it the millennial effect. We have never seen... Um, based on SHRM research, uh, we've never seen as many millennials say, I don't care if I have 10 years of experience in finance, I'm not liking this and I'm gonna jump ship and switch industries altogether. So there are millennials these days, unlike we've ever seen that will say, I'm switching careers altogether. In which case an employer could scoop them up, but they it would require training. And the other big uh, uh, population that's out there ready for the picking are the Gen Zers that are coming in. They're graduating, they're here, and many of them are demanding working from home options. So even if it's not 100% remote, can you be flexible and maybe have some sort of a hybrid model or once a week, or um, you can, you know, take off, you know, one week at out of a month, you can work exclusively from home. If we're not getting creative with that, we also can't tap into that new um, generation that's coming in. And last I read, they're 60 million strong. They're coming out here. They want jobs, but they also are demanding flexibility. So we need to be able to respond to that as employers. Yeah, I will say one of the better reporters I ever hired a while ago, I recall, did not have a journalism degree, had not graduated from college, he had a certificate, and I'm not making fun of this, but he had a certificate from somebody's radio training course that was in a strip mall. He was very honest about this, but he was a really, really, really good reporter. And I assume he's still somewhere out in the world reporting, but he was pretty great. 
Um, and I could count on him for a lot. And he came with no paper, really, support anything. So let me ask you all another question. Um, we talk about we need to have policies. We need to have open minds. We need to have flexibility. We need we need to do this. And yet, as as managers and decision makers, you know, we're all getting beat on the head every day, and we're putting in more hours, and we're putting in more effort, and we're having to deal with all this. And we also have flooded basements, and we also had trees come through our roof, and we also have to take our dogs to the vet and you know deal with children. We've still got all these other issues. What is some what is some advice you can say that we could be doing to take care of ourselves? You know, it's it's like on on the um, when you're on a plane and the stewardess says, if the oxygen masks drop down, put yours on first before helping children or the elderly. Like that's of course you know you don't pass out from oxygen deprivation. How, how would you? And this also comes as a question from from someone watching suggestions anyone what what do we do to take care of ourselves and other managers i think it's really important that you model what you want your employees to do if you don't do it as a leader you you can't ex you can't say do as i say not as i do i suppose you could do it but it's not always successful right and so it's really important to look at things differently and i've, I've just been amazed you know i'm i'm newer to my I, I entered this i've been with the university for 17 years but entered this role during the pandemic and i remember i, I was recruiting a year and a half prior to that and someone wanted the same level senior director role and they wanted to work remotely just a few days a week and they were like, oh no, can't do that, can't do that. You know, <laughs> you can't do it. That cannot be done. The person cannot have this role. And so I came into the role in a pandemic remotely sitting at my home in my basement, you know, being a leader and I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's okay. And, and everyone else was doing it. So um, that helped me see things differently. As I came into the organization, I just started thinking, gosh, I don't, I don't have to work all the time. I don't have to work every weekend. I don't have to check my email all of the time. And so I modeled that behavior for my team and I talked about it. So I think being vulnerable with people explaining, saying, Yes, my son is at home at that time. You know, at one point, you know, my son's at home and this is this is really hard. So being able to say that I had people come back to me and thank me just for saying it. I, I was with a group of women leaders. We were all having breakfast and I loved it. We were all really good and everyone was talking about what they'd done in the pandemic. And then I just said, you know, this is really hard. And I'm really tired of seeing people posting on the internet saying we should be learning a new language when our kids are at home. You know, they were saying you should be working out and losing weight and doing all these extra things. I said, I can't do it. I'm, I'm really stressed out. And it was funny. Everyone kind of sighed and said, oh my gosh, I'm feeling the same thing. And then funny on the Zoom, all these babies came in, right? We folks were home with children and, and they brought their <laughs> children and we were, you know, we were kind of struggling. So I think just even saying it, right? Saying it out loud, acknowledging this is happening. But that modeling piece is so important in showing folks that you should, it's okay to get a massage every once in a while. And you should, right? You should be taking care of yourself. So one way to think about it, sometimes leaders, I know leaders can be stubborn. Um, I've been there, done that. Um, so so you, you can, you know, let them know that, um, you know, if, if employees you know, they have the, these, they know they don't have to work all night, let's say, um, and, and they know that they can have these kind of normal and reasonable hours and they'll be able to spend time with their family and they'll have work-life balance. They're going to have more focus when they're at work and they're, they're going to be happier and they're going to be more productive. So selfishly, you can model it just so that you can get more out of your employees. So that would be my advice. <laughs> I would echo something similar to that and just say, you know, keep things in perspective um, because, yeah, the irony about building a great team is that when things get tough and you've got really highly engaged employees, it's likely those groups are going to be burned out first because they feel such a strong sense of ownership to not let anybody down. And they're the ones who are going to really struggle with keeping a healthy balance, um, especially when you know, when you're working from home and, and technology lets you be connected 24 seven. And so while you don't wanna defer or discourage that high level of engagement, it really is important to keep things in perspective. And like Talinda said, to model that behavior. So leaders need to show that commitment to maintaining their own work-life balance by taking time off, 
avoiding those late night calls and emails and keeping a sense of humor, making sure that people know that in generally speaking, um, it's not generally life or death if something takes from this afternoon to tomorrow to get completed or even a few days beyond. So not only you know, will leaders feel healthier when they keep that perspective, but like Talinda said, then their behavior is gonna share that clear message with their teams that it's okay for them to do the same thing. I think um, I would agree with that. I think one of the things that's been a real struggle is um, there used to be clear delineation between your work life and your home life. And now if you're working from home, every waking minute is potentially a working minute. You know? mm-hmm. and, um, the temptation is there to answer that 8.30 p.m. email or phone call because, you know, you don't, you're not on a hard set schedule and, and you didn't leave the office at 5 p.m. because it, it's all intertwined now. And so to set that expectation, I really like what you said to Linda about setting the expectation for your team. You know, I'm not going to answer phone calls or emails, you know, on the weekends or after 7 p.m. Or, or whatever it might be so that they know that and hopefully models to them that they're not expected to do that as well. Um, what I've found over the years is I, I try to remind myself not to look at that email at 10 p.m. right before right. I go to bed. <laughs> Don't check my work email because, you know, it'll interrupt your sleep. You'll have a you know terrible night and you'll wake up with stress, you know. So um, sort of setting those personal boundaries yourself as well, I think, is, is pretty important. Okay, so we're in our last 10 minutes. If anyone has any questions watching, please send them in. And speaking of questions, Becky, we have one specifically for you, if you would. Um, The question is, your company, ESP, had remarkable success with employee COVID vaccination rates months before employer mandates were announced. Could you share some tips, success factors, if you would, for how you motivated people versus mandating, encouraging this type of change. So that, in other words, we're talking about modeling, modeling for other companies. What did ESP do that worked well? Um, Well, a little bit tongue in cheek. I just badgered the heck out of them. (laughs) Um, We sent, I had, you know, email campaigns almost daily sharing, you know, FAQs from the CDC about the virus. Um, We ran a whole series about the vaccine and, and, um, you know, I'd send out emails saying, here's where you can get it. Here's the link to sign up. Here's, you know, the information. And so we just, you know, trusted in their own, you know, ability to determine what was appropriate by giving them a tremendous amount of information, but always in small bites. So we got a lot of feedback that people were using the information and forwarding on to members of their families and other people within their social groups. And so um, I think they appreciated having credible um, information. But then, so we didn't, we didn't do an incentive. Um, we didn't do anything like that. We were fortunate to get access to kind of an early program uh, through Mercy so that our employees could specifically make their own appointments. But um, the one thing I think that probably was the most compelling though, and this I, I won't take credit for, I actually got it from um, and a story I listened to on NPR, was to make it personal. So I shared, unfortunately, in my own life, we've had a a number of of losses and um, long-term COVID cases that are just, you know, ripping um, through our family. And so shared a lot of of personal stories about what this virus can do um, to bring it home and then really encourage people to, to think about their own stories and then talk to their doctor that if they were feeling compelled because it was something that what the company was making them do or that politically was unpopular, drive them to a credible source, which is their family doctor and to talk with their family about what was right for them. So yeah, we did have a lot of success um, with our vaccine rate. Anyone else want to chime in on that of what, what you've heard from uh, businesses, people you talk to, suggestions you may have made, good, good strategies? Well, a lot of the companies we've worked with um, chose that education and encouragement path, you know, for a long time uh, with mixed success. I mean, some of them might have been healthcare providers or nursing homes or whatever, and, and actually the numbers were could be disappointing, um, but but really they firmly believed in that and trying to, the first uh, line of attack, if you will, being education and encouragement and support. Um, you know, now I, I think a lot of those decisions are being made by the federal mandates that have come out, but 
um, Becky, I mean, kudos to you and your company to, to be able to, to make that personal appeal and get a, a good result. I don't know, Samantha, have you had any um, examples of encouragement and uh, education working successfully? Yeah, um, I, I agree with you. I'm seeing mixed success out there. And it's almost, it's, it's you know, two pronged. There's the first part, how do we hire people who are vaccinated because we need to be hiring. And in that case, it's really just making your expectations and your requirements clear in the interviewing and the posting process without asking any personal um, health information too early. Uh, we have to comply with HIPAA and make sure um, that we're doing that correctly. And then saving the paperwork correctly. But on the employer side, we just like Terry work with so many different organizations and it's a mixed bag. Um, what might be surprising to you is that the industry that we are having clients struggle the most is the long-term care industry. Mm -hmm. We have several clients that are in nurse that are nursing homes and you would think that their staff would be vaccinated or trying to be vaccinated desperately. But when this mandate came out and as we're navigating it, we will be terming people be eventually, you know, after going through the accommodation process, if they require it, because it's mandatory and people firmly still believe that it, it's not for them. Um, so we're navigating that space. Education has helped, but it also in some areas has come up short and as people are resolute in their um, decision making. So um, it's difficult, but we're doing the best we can and we're trying to educate people. We have done incentives, um, small gift cards here and there or drawings or even, for example, um, little parties for success if teams decide to get vaccinated together. Um, but it, it is a mixed bag and it's it's very, in some areas, encouraging and and others very discouraging. Okay, one other topic I wanted to talk about before we, we leave this panel, and this is for you, Brandon. Um, so, so many people are working from home. In some cases, like mine, I'm here at home some days, I'm in the office, I schlep stuff back and forth. Um, what are some concerns that you've seen come up with SEC Midwest and at ProCircular in terms of you know, all the technology and how we, how do we, and, and I know this is a giant question. Mm -hmm. What are some key, just a few tips in our last waning moments here that you would suggest to companies, what do they need to mostly pay attention to? So all their stuff isn't just stolen. I don't it's, know how else to put that. It's nine fifty seven, And you just asked <laughs> me a giant. <laughs> okay. I told you I was going to ask eventually. Here well, we that's are. A big, okay. Oh, all right. So I would say, if I had to say it really quickly, uh, VPN. Uh, so it's, it's usually when you remote in, use virtual private network. So you remote in using two-factor authentication <clears throat> or multi-factor authentication. That's where you, um, uh, something you know, something you have. So basically when you know your password and you get a text on something you have, so you have your phone. So that's two-factor. Uh, that's becoming more and more common. And now insurance is requiring that. Uh, or you, you know, you won't, when your insurance comes due, they, you might not get your insurance if you don't have two factor on, uh, for your employees to get That's access you do to a password and then ask you something else, <laughs> yep. right? It's the follow-up. Yeah. And there could be, uh, multiple ways of doing it. One could be a text message, like SMS. One could be, uh, authentication, like a push authentication, like Google authenticator, Duo or something. And another one could be that six digit code that we like that the best, that six digit code you have to enter. Um, those two things are probably the biggest. Um, just this, this is sort of a technical thing we're seeing. There's been a resurgence of RDP, which is a way to remote in without using, uh, without using VPN, which is bad. Um, so, but I which guess- it, I would, Which the, the RDP is bad or the VPN oh, is bad? Uh, RDP is bad, external RDP okay. is bad. Thank I'll you. Say, and, and if there's IT people on the call, they'll know what that means. Okay. You, use a proper <laughs> VPN, use two-factor authentication. And, and so I would say the overarching issue here is the perimeter of the, you know, like the article, the Gazette article from six months ago, the perimeter of an organization is no longer the brick and mortar, you know, firewall, the building, the perimeter are people because people are scattered and they have to log into things. So if we think of like inside and outside of the organization, the perimeter is just every person who can access the year company resources. And I ask this because we're all, we, you know, we're all get in these meetings 
in which someone from IT says, okay, we need to switch from something you've never heard of, even though you've been using it for three years, to something else. You don't know what I'm talking about. And we need to do this. And we all need to get just smarter and better at this to protect our property. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's, it's usually because the, you know, the world moves so fast. So I, it, it, whatever the thing is you're talking about in your organization with IT is like, hey, there's a vulnerability in this thing that's been discovered, or now we have money to implement these new security controls. It's basically a cat and mouse game with the bad guys. As new vulnerabilities come out, we try our best to protect them. And, and your IT organizations will try their best to protect uh, your resources and availability and confidentiality of data. Okay. I, that's, I, that's a tough, it's, that's a I, big I one. I'm doing my best. I, I know. Brandon, <laughs> in, in case you, you don't read the Sunday Gazette on a regular basis, once a month we have a column called Cyber Sunday, and Brandon is one of the people from SEC Midwest who contributes to that. So more stuff on IT security. So we talk about that too. And we are at time. I want to thank all our panelists this morning. I want to thank all of those watching. I want to thank our sponsor again, Bergden KDV, and to Nicole, to our community sponsors, New Boco and Quarter Careers. Remember, this very discussion has been recorded, so you can watch it on the Gazette site again later if you want to. You can watch it again and again if you want, um, but it will be recorded. It will be there. Keep reading the Gazette in print and online, and thank you, and we'll see you next year. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.